revolting at Hatsor and uh, revolting against the elites that uh, rule the city. In fact, the entire Canaanite city-state system, including Hatsor and Jericho, breaks down. Archaeology and ancient texts clearly show that it is the result of a long period of decline and upheaval that sweeps through Mesopotamia, the Aegean region, and the Egyptian Empire around 1200 BC. And when the dust, as it were, settles, when we can begin to see what takes the place of these, of this great state system, we find a number of new peoples suddenly coming into focus in a kind of void that is created with the dissolution of the great state system. Can archaeologists find the Israelites among these new people? In the 1970s, archaeologists started wide-ranging surveys throughout the central hill country of Canaan. Today, primarily the Palestinian territory of the West Bank. I was teaching at that time. We used to take students and go twice a week to the highlands. And every day we used to cover between two and three square kilometers and uh, this uh, accumulates very slowly into the coverage of the entire area. Israel Finkelstein and teams of archaeologists walked out grids over large areas, collecting every fragment of ancient pottery lying on the surface. Over seven years, he covered nearly 400 square miles sorting pottery, and marking the locations of where it was found on a map. By dating the pottery, Finkelstein discovered that before 1200 BC, there were approximately 25 settlements. He estimated the total population of those settlements to be three to 5,000 inhabitants. But just 200 years later, there's a very sharp increase in settlements and people. Then you get this boom of population growing and growing. Then we are speaking about 250 sites. And the population grows also 10 times, from a few thousand to 45,000 or so. Now this is very dramatic and cannot be explained as natural growth. People, this rate is impossible in ancient times. If not natural growth, perhaps these are the waves of dispersed people settling down following the collapse of the great state systems. Then, more evidence of a new culture is discovered. A new type of simple dwelling never seen before. And it's in the exact location where both the Merneptah Stila and the Bible place the Israelites. So the sites in which this type of house appears throughout the country, this is where Israelites lived. And they are sometimes even called the Israelite house, the Israelite type house. But the people who lived in those villages seem to be arranged more or less in a kind of an egalitarian society because there are no major architectural installations. If you look at the finds, the finds are relatively poor. Pottery is more or less mundane. I don't want to offend the early settlers or the early Israelites. Very little art. Curiously, the mundane pottery found at these new Israelite villages is very similar to the everyday pottery found at the older Canaanite cities, like Hatzor. In fact, the Israelite house is practically the only thing that is different.
this broad similarity is leading archaeologists to a startling new conclusion about the origins of the ancient Israelites. The notion is that most of the early Israelites were originally Canaanites, displaced Canaanites. The Israelites were always in the land of Israel. They were natives, but they were different kinds of groups. They were basically the have-nots. So what we're dealing with is a movement of peoples, but not an invasion of armed hordes from outside, but rather a social and economic revolution. Ancient texts describe how the Egyptian rulers and their Canaanite vassal kings burden the lower classes of Canaan with taxes and even slavery. A radical new theory based on archaeology suggests what happens next. As that oppressive social system declines, families and tribes of serfs, slaves, and common Canaanites seize the opportunity. In search of a better way of life, they abandon the old city-states and head for the hills. Free from the oppression of their past, they eventually emerge in a new place as a new people. The Israelites. In the text, you have a story of the Israelites coming from outside and then besieging uh, the Canaanite cities, destroying them, and then becoming a nation uh, in the land of Canaan. Uh, seven shirt from the Middle Bronze Age. Whereas archaeology tells us something which is the opposite. In the Late Bronze Age. According to archaeology, the rise of early Israel is an outcome of the collapse of Canaanite society, not the reason for that collapse. Archaeology reveals that the Israelites were themselves originally Canaanites. So why does the Bible consistently cast the Israelites as outsiders in Canaan? Abraham's wanderings from Mesopotamia. Moses leading slaves out of Egypt and into the Promised Land and Joshua conquering Canaan from outside? The answer may lie in their desire to forge a distinctly new identity. Identity is created, as psychologists tell us, by talking about what you are not, by talking about another. In order to figure out who I am, I have to figure out who I am not. Conspicuously absent from Israelite villages, are the grand palaces and the extravagant pottery associated with the kings and rich elites of Canaan. The Israelites did not like the Canaanite system and they defined themselves in contrast to that system. So by not using decorated pottery, by not using important pottery, they developed an ideology of simplicity which marked the difference between them and the Egyptian Canaanite system if the Israelites wanted to distinguish themselves from their Canaanite past, what better way than to create a story about destroying them? But the stories of Abraham, Exodus, and the conquest serve another purpose. They celebrate the power of what the Bible says is the foremost distinction between the Israelites and all other people, their God. In later Judaism, the name of God is considered so sacred it is never to be spoken. We don't know exactly what it means. We don't know how it was pronounced. But it seems to have been the personal name of the God of Israel. So his title, in a sense, was God, and his name was these four letters, which in English would be Y-H-W-H, -H, which we think were probably pronounced something like Yahweh. But Yahweh only appears in the Hebrew Bible. His name is nowhere to be found in Canaanite texts or stories. 
So where do the Israelites find their God? The search for the origins of Yahweh leads scholars back to ancient Egypt. Here in the royal city of Karnak, for over a thousand years, pharaohs celebrated their power with statues, obelisks, and carved murals on temple walls. Here on the north wall of Karnak, we have scenes depicting the victories in battle of Seti I, the father of Ramses the Great. Seti here commemorates one of his greatest victories over the Shasu. The Shasu were a people who lived in the deserts of southern Canaan, now Jordan and northern Saudi Arabia, at around the same time as the Israelites emerged. Egyptian texts say one of the places where the Shasu lived is called YHW, probably pronounced Yahoo, likely the name of their patron god. That name Yahoo is strangely similar to Yahweh, the name of the Israelite god. In the Bible, the place where the Shasu lived is referred to as Midian. It is here, before the Exodus, the Bible tells us Moses first encounters Yahweh in the form of a burning bush. Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Exodus 3, 5 and 15. 